All right. Well, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, happy Palindrome Day. Did you know that? Today is, and the date is 0202-2020. Oh, yeah, that's, that, wow. Someone's sitting in the back like, oh, I was told there was no math coming here. There's no math. Uh, I'm really happy about something, though. Can we just celebrate since July, 99 people have given their lives to Christ. We want to celebrate that because it's extraordinary. And so this entire year, this entire year, we are in a series called Carriers of the Heart. And every month, we're looking at a different value. So for Life Center, we have nine values. And of course, Christmas is Christmas, Easter is Easter. But outside of that, we're in Carriers of the Heart. So because it's February, we have a brand new value. And values are simply things that we treasure. We're not saying we're better than, we just really value these things. And the value we're going to talk about this month is called wholehearted. Everyone say wholehearted. That you and I have to be, live our lives in a wholehearted fashion. And sometimes in order to describe what something is, it's easier if you look at what it isn't. Because most of us are very well acquainted. Wholehearted can seem a little odd, but you know the opposite to wholehearted. And then you've probably heard it before. And that is when someone is living a half-hearted life or a half-hearted effort. Usually our most pointed criticism to people in groups, if you were paired up as a child or as a young person, you know, you had to go to school and get in a group with these people or you had an athletics. If the coach ever said to you, you're given a half-hearted effort, you knew precisely what they were saying. It wasn't like... You didn't say, well, thank you very much. I got 50%. I'm pretty good. That's not what happened. You knew there was a pointed criticism to your life that you're present, but you're not giving your all. You're not really here. Your body's here, but you're somewhere else. And oftentimes, one of the most sharp criticisms that Jesus ever gives towards those who are religious, so that if we are all consider ourselves followers of Christ, or if you're new here, not yet a follower of Christ, welcome. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, um, this is one we have to pay particular attention to because we're prone to this in our lives. Jesus oftentimes would bring his most pointed criticism to those who would consider themselves religious, and he would quote from the, an old prophet in the Old Testament, and he would say this, Your lips are saying all the right things, but your heart is not connected to what you're saying. In other words, with your lips you do worship me, but your heart, it's in vain. It's it's nowhere near connected to who you are and what you really believe and what you really think. And it was this really pointed, pointed criticism. And a moment ago, you just saw life groups. Before we go any further, I just want to take 10 seconds and just say to you, I am as lead pastor of Life Center, having the privilege of leading all of our campuses, whether it's here in Orleans, Canada, Cornwall, online, and Lord willing, in the future ahead, downtown. Um, I am in a life group. And I don't show up at the life group as a pastor. I show up at the life group as a follower of Jesus. And I leave my title at the door. And it's this beautiful opportunity that I have to be in community. And I want you to know that from my experience I need the people that I'm in life group with, and hopefully I help them out a little bit too. But they are like a mirror sometimes. They can challenge me, and just by them sharing their stories, it helped me to be more like Jesus. So there is no such person, and there is no such place where any follower of Jesus ever arrives where we don't need other people to help us be everything that God has called us to be. I would even go so far as to say, if you're not in some form of community, you will not experience the fullness of all that God has for you. It doesn't have to be a perfect life group. There's no such ones. And you can try some different ones on. You may not find the right one the exact first time. That's okay. But it's important for you and I, whether it's in Bible school, it can be that way where we begin to get to know people, but it's important to be known and it's important to know other people. It really, truly is. So talking about wholehearted as I was just a moment ago, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together to touch and to transform our hearts. And here's what I want you to know, that Jesus is so passionate about touching our hearts and saving our hearts and redeeming our hearts and holding our hearts and mending our hearts, restoring our hearts and filling our hearts, empowering our hearts, and then sending us out into a lost and broken world. That whether you read any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, if you look at the life of Jesus, if you see the heart of God, it is always not only to touch our hearts, but to transform our hearts. That God does his deepest work oftentimes on the inside of our lives and takes 
sometimes a long time for it to show up or a degree of time for it to show up on the outside, but God begins to move on the inside. And one of the things I want you to know is last year as a staff, we were wrestling through all of these values and the value of wholehearted was the value where we had the deepest conflict, the deepest things to work in and out and through. And one of the words that we used as a placeholder before we settled on wholehearted is the word excellence. We love excellence at Life Center. We love things to be done excellent or as best as we can. But one of the dangers for us when we begin to wrestle with it as a team together is that excellence can quickly become about outside and performance. And here's what I want you to know. If you want to join the worship team, and can we just give it a hand for the worship team? They've been here since 6.45 this morning. So it's not for the faint of heart of those serving in the back. They've been here since 6.45, 7 a.m. this morning, getting everything ready. But if you want to serve on the worship team, of course, you have to go through an audition. It's not just like, I've got a heart to sing. If you can't carry a tune, then then you, you can sing in your life group of one, and you can enjoy it. But maybe, just maybe, so, so we want things to be done excellent for sure. But here's the heart at Life Center. It's not about pitch and performance as much as it is about God's presence. In other words, we don't want anyone walking away saying, wow, what a performance. We want people walking away saying, oh my goodness, what was that presence? There are people who come to Life Center every single week who don't know Jesus, who can't say it's God's presence, but all they say is, as soon as I walked in, I just began to cry, and I have no idea why I began to cry. Or as soon as I showed up here, there was an aura, there was a this, there was a that. It is the presence of God that begins to move. Why is that significant? Because for us at Life Center, here's where I think excellence is danger. At work, we have to do things with excellence. Everywhere is with excellence. But again, excellence can drive us to perfectionism, and perfectionism always destroys the heart of the gospel. Because the heart of the gospel isn't your perfection. It is the perfection of what Jesus did for us. It is not based on our behavior, but a blood-stained cross. And then the blood-stained cross transforms our behavior, but it's not earning its effort. But it's totally different. So we got rid of the word uh, excellence. We still value it, but for us, it's wholehearted. And this is what we mean when we say wholehearted. Wholehearted people do the same things as everybody else. They just do those same things differently. So when we say wholehearted at Life Center, this is what we mean. All of me, more of Jesus. Okay, I'm fully here, but yet I'm trusting what God can do. We bring our everything. We set lofty goals unapologetically. We set audacious goals unapologetically. But we try, and then we try again, understanding that sometimes we fail. Jesus sets us free from traps, though, of perfectionism and comparison, or I should say unhealthy comparison. We bring our best, but we trust that God is greater. We bring our best to everything and anything that we do, but together we trust that God is greater. So anything and all that we do at Life Center, we want to do our absolute best, but we are not believing for a second that we're the savior of the world, that we're the healer of the world, that we're the deliverer of the world. We are pointing to the one who is, and we are showing the world the one who is. It's not all about us. It is all about him, but God uses all of us to point people to him. Make sense? So this is the value that we're digging into this month. And we're going to look at a life of a man by the name of Joshua. Everyone say Joshua. We're going to look at an individual in the Old Testament. His name was Joshua, who who lived a life from a wholehearted place. Not from a perfect place, but from a wholehearted place. And here's what the scripture says. Before I read the scripture, actually, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 8 to 10, I want to say this. I want you to picture something in your mind. I want you to picture a large, large, large campsite, large campsite with tents as far as the eye can see, okay, all over here. And then I want you to picture a good, good distance, a distance enough where there's a single tent over there. Now, the tent that is over there is, if you were in the campsite, it's far enough that you can see it, but it's far enough away That's a bit of a journey to get there, a little walk to get there, okay? So it's not five, ten feet, it's hundreds of feet away. You can see it, but it's really in the distance, okay? That's what, that's a picture of what is occurring right here. And it says, whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up. Everyone say, rise up. So it says that all the people, not some of them, all of them, they would all rise up, and then each of them would stand at his tent or her tent, at the door of their tent, and they would watch Moses until he had gone into the tent, okay? So here's all the campground. 
There's Moses' tent way over there, okay? They can see it. They, they can see Moses walking to that tent. It's not in the campground. It's far away from the campground, but enough that they could see it. And so they would stand at the door of their tent. They would rise up. They'd stand and they would watch Moses until he disappeared from their sight. He goes into the tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud, this beautiful present, this example in the Old Testament of God's presence being there, would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses and when all the people everyone say all the people this is everyone all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent which tent not their tent Moses's tent all right way over there they would again they would rise up and they would worship each at his tent door Everything in here is good. It's beautiful. What's happening? It's, it's, it's worthy. They're rising up. They're worshiping. God's presence is over there. Everyone say over there. So God's presence is over there. Moses is over there. They can see it. They wouldn't just stay inside their tent. There was a moment of reverence and respect to God being presence. But they stood at the entrance of their own tent. In other words, they stood far enough away to be safe, but enough that they could see. But what the scripture says is that there was this individual who was Moses' assistant, and his name was Joshua. And I'm not saying it was better than, because what they were doing here, there's nothing wrong with it. But Joshua did something different. Everybody would rise up and worship. Everybody would watch. But Joshua did that differently. And here's what it says. It says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. How powerful is that? It says, when Moses turned again into the camp, so get it. Moses has gone into the tent speaking with God. And then he gets out of the tent and begins to make his way back to the camp. As Moses is making his way back to the camp, this is what it says about Joshua. It says, when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, here's what it says, he would not depart from the tent. And so Joshua was Moses' assistant. And so there he is. As Moses walks away, you would think an assistant should always be with Moses. I mean, a good assistant should be, right? Right? But there was something about Joshua that he was not content just to stand at the door of his tent and see what God was doing over there. That he got as close as he possibly could to the presence of God. He did the same thing that everybody was doing, but he just did it differently. There's a way in which he pursued God's presence that was different than those around him. That set him apart from those around him. Not better than, just different. Now, Joshua could not enter the tent. That was not his place. That was the place for Moses and God. But where would he position himself? Right outside the tent, as close as he possibly could. Again, while the people had their focus on Moses, Joshua had his focus on God's presence. While the people had their eyes on Moses, Joshua had his eyes on the Lord. While the people stayed close enough to see, but far enough to be safe, Joshua risked it a little bit further. But Joshua's hunger for God's presence took him from his tent door and positioned him by God's tent door. For wholehearted people, here's what I want to say. Little details matter as they create separation. Now listen, not separation from or against or better than others. That's not what I'm speaking about at all because that's oftentimes self-righteousness and arrogance. That's not what I'm speaking about. But to be set apart is to be holy. It is to set apart things in our hearts and lives. And so when the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, moves upon our hearts, does things in our lives, it oftentimes and often and always sets us apart. And so perhaps in your life, there's a a behavior that is not healthy for your life. There's a sin issue that's not healthy in our lives. When the Holy Spirit comes, it's to set us apart from those things. But there's also dreams and desires and things that we have in our heart and life that when the Holy Spirit comes, it is to set us apart from those things, to not just do 
everything different for the sake of being different, that we may do the same things, but we do them differently. Here's what I want you to know, that every single time I come to church, every single time, you are not an audience, we are a body. This is not a performance. I'm using one spiritual gift this morning called teaching, hopefully to help and bring of aid to your life. But here's what I know. God does not only in this moment want to use one life. He wants to use your life and your life and your life and your life. There is no such thing as coming to the house of the Lord and not being on that Sunday. We are always all in saying, God, however you want to use my life, I'm available. If you have a gift of encouragement or exhortation, he may want you to encourage or exhort somebody. You may be walking in and you have a spiritual gift of helps and you see someone struggling to hold things or walking with a baby in their arm in a bag and you walk over and you just be of assistance in that moment. It's not just a natural thing. It's a supernatural thing. Or perhaps you hold the door for someone. And if you sometimes you hold the door, you end up holding the door for a lot of people. That's okay. You serve in the nursery or you serve in this place or you serve in in that place. That's great. We use the gifts that God has given us all in, wholehearted. It's not just when we're on, when we're singing, when we're teaching, when we're worshiping. How many of you know that we are all worshiping God when we're worshiping together? It's no one's job to conjure us up. Yes, we have places of leadership for people to lead us in worship, but it's to lead us to where our hearts are already postured. It's to lead us in a place of affection where our hearts are, again, they're, they're all in. Separation is not from or against others, but it is set apart perhaps from where we are to the next step that where God wants us to be or where we could be. For those of you who are leaders and you have a boss or somebody in authority over you, Joshua's life is a wonderful life to look at because look, Here's Joshua as close to the tent as he can get. But he doesn't go inside the tent because that's not yet his place. If you know anything about Joshua's life, the scripture's later going to say that when Moses dies, now Joshua steps into this place. As a sideline here, a little leadership moment. As God is beginning to grow you as a leader, here's what you need to recognize. You need to recognize the difference between leaning in and leading out. You need to recognize the difference between leading in and leading out. That oftentimes before God uses you out there, he begins to create room in here. He begins to set you apart on the inside. He begins to call you that though everybody around you is doing the same things, you have to begin to do things differently. How often do we settle for pursuing our dreams but from a safe distance? Here's all I know. It's one thing to stand at your tent and watch what God is doing. It's another thing to get as close to God's presence, which in that day and time would have been a frightening thing to do, but it's also where the action was. Listen, it it, it is something for you and I, something changes in your life when you stop only pursuing God on your time and you open your heart to say, God, you can have my whole calendar. That when you show up at work, it's not just like, well, God, I gave you your time was on Sunday. Now it's my time. There's something that begins to change when it's not about your or my time. It's just, God, you're the creator of time. And you can use my time. Jesus said the hour is coming and is now here. We're true worshipers. We'll worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Because of the work of Jesus, you and I have access to God's presence 24-7. We don't have to go to a tent because of what Jesus has done. However, however, Today is never a message that tries to put down. It's a message that wants to come under to say this. is never settle for an introduction when you were created for intimacy with Jesus. I celebrate if you gave your life to Jesus five years ago, but I also want to remind you that the goal is not only salvation. The goal is for you and I that everything in our life gives glory to God, that your life infects and affects people all around you. Again, it's not just salvation. is isn't me, myself, and I. It is this ministry that you're given where you wake up every day saying, God, you can actually use my life to make a difference with the gifts that it is that you're giving me. The second and final thing that I would say during this service is there's a second thing that we see Joshua do differently. Everybody say differently. There's a second thing that we can see that Joshua does differently 
than others around him. And it is this, Joshua does not confuse wholehearted with always feeling. So Joshua does things differently. When everyone else was comfortable at the tent, he gets as close as he possibly could. As well, Joshua does not confuse wholehearted with always feeling. Over and over again, there's a specific phrase that you will see in the book of Joshua if you read it. Joshua chapter 3 verse 1 says this, Then Joshua rose early in the morning. And they set out from a town with a really unfortunate name. And they came to the Jordan. And he and all the people of Israel, they lodged there before they passed over. In Joshua chapter 6 verse 12, it says this, Then Joshua, ready for it, rose early in the morning. And the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Now before you panic, this is not a message on you rising early in the morning. Or perhaps it could be. I don't know. That's not my call to make. But here's what I am saying. Living a wholehearted life is embracing how wholehearted living engages disciplines and not only feelings. It engages disciplines, not only feelings. I promise you, if you look around today, there are people sitting in here that didn't want to come here today. I promise you today, there are people who got up this morning and didn't feel like doing devotions, didn't feel like praying, didn't, I've never one time in my life felt like fasting, ever, <laughs> never. Not even when we call a fast, I still don't feel like it. I've, I don't even think I've ever had a morning where I felt like waking up, really. Some of you just wake up like, hey, the birds are chirping, do, 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 do. Never, never. Every single morning is, like, every morning of my life is, oh my gosh, it's morning again? <laughs> like, I'm just in bed, un em embraced by the comforter. That's a name for the Holy Spirit, by the way, but I'm really talking, I'm just talking about the blanket. But I'm just like in the embrace of the comforter. And every morning I look to my, I, I'm lying like this, I'm a stomach sleeper, don't judge me. And I look to my right, and Lori's always gone. Right? She's just downstairs, not like she's left me, she's just downstairs. But she's always up before me. I've never felt like it. Like, like even on days where I should feel like getting up, like, my, my Lord, this is your wedding day. <laughs> and I'm like, 15 more minutes. Never, like, I, I, I felt all about that, of course, but I didn't feel it. You know, the enemy lies to many of you that when you look around, it's like, well, well everybody else in here, like, loves doing their devotions. Everybody else in here feels like, how many of you always feel like forgiving? Nobody. Who woke up this morning and said, oh my gosh, you know what? Today I get to give away some of my money. <laughs> Woo! It's tithing day, it's tithing day. No, I mean, it's this place of like, we wrestle with these things called spiritual disciplines. The desire to go, so to go where you desire to go, you're going to have to do what you don't want to do. For Joshua, that meant rising early in the morning. I don't know what it looks like for you. But wholehearted does not mean that you always feel it. But it does mean in spite of what I feel, I am fully persuaded, I am fully devoted, I am all in. John Maxwell, as a leadership teacher, once said, it's so important to make important decisions in your life that you make a decision and then you spend the rest of your life managing a decision that you have already made. Whereas people who oftentimes struggle in life wait until they feel it to make every decision. And so every time I've got to make a decision, I've got to make a decision, I've got to make a decision. No, no, you can settle in your heart who you desire to be and then you manage that decision versus every single Sunday getting up and going, should I, should I not? I grew up in a house that said, as for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord, so let's go. Didn't matter what we felt like, we just engaged it as a discipline. 
And now we're instilling that in our kids. And my kids respond to it the same way I did. <laughs> right? My kids do devotions to say, God is such a God of justice. Like I was the worst, period, worst, period, worst at devotions. Like family devotions. Like I, during family devotions, I would laugh. I would always find something funny, which wasn't funny to my father. Because he was trying to explain something and I'd be laughing. Or, or one time, we were going through the whole Bible as a family together. And as soon as he would, okay, this is, this is going to go back. As soon as he would press play on the tape recorder, And he would just stop the tape recorder and just say nothing. And that would terrify me because I would know, like, oh, shoot, I fell asleep again. You're like, so now, do you know what our house looks like when we do devotions? Oh, your house must be very orderly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's something orderly, all right. It's chaos, right, Lord? Like the dream of what we have from the reality of what we live. <laughs> and speaking of difference, can I just take a minute and go on a rant here for a minute? If you're here and you're under 20 years old, I believe in you. I believe in your destiny. I believe in your future. I believe the church is in amazing hands. I think you're extraordinary. And I think you're destroying the human language, the English language. <laughs> I think you're destroying it. Just like my, but there's a generation, don't forget, there's a generation older than me that thought my generation was destroying the, the English language. And in a lot of ways we did. But let me give you an example. Let me give you two examples. Number one, I have two daughters. And they came to me recently and they just said, oh, dad, we just want to sit and spill the tea. And I was like, you spilled the tea? Well, like in my head, I'm like, clean it up. And I didn't even know you drank tea. And if you were making a tea, I love tea. Like, I love tea. I drink like five cups of tea. Why didn't you offer to make me a tea? And they looked at me like, what is wrong with you? And I looked at them and like, no, seriously, what is wrong? What are you, what's wrong with, what are you talking about? They said, dad, spilling the tea doesn't mean spilling the tea. It means we want to talk to you about something. I'm like, well, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been easier if you just would have said those words? which missed the point, and I sat down, and they spilt the tea. <laughs> I was in a store that I had no business being in a store at 46 years old, no business being in that store. There's nothing in that store I should justifiably be buying, and I wasn't buying anything for me. I was buying something for my daughter, a pair of shoes. So I picked the shoes off the wall, as you do, and then the, la the, the lady, that's a big stretch. The, the, the person working was like 10 feet away, and I'm holding the shoe. I've told this story before. But I'm holding the shoe that I want to buy. That I want to give the store my money for this shoe. And the person 10 feet away says, sauce me the shoe. <laughs> and I knew they spoke English because I understood every word. But I had no idea. Well, so I looked at her and I just said, 46 years old. <laughs> and then she said, oh, I just meant toss me the shoe. And I said, then just say that. Just say toss me the shoe. <laughs> what I wanted to say was this. And actually, no, I didn't say this because I'm a Canadian. What I wanted to say is, actually, no, I'm not going to sauce you the shoe. You're going to walk the 10 feet and take the shoe. It's called customer service. <laughs> it's not my job to throw it over there. Like you, you. And then I felt like the old man yelling at the clouds. Like, I am literally one degree away from the get off my lawn guy. That's <laughs> where I'm at. But here's what I want to say. If you're under 20... If you need to spill the tea with the Holy Spirit, then let the Holy Spirit spill the tea. And if God asks you to sauce something, then sauce it. <laughs> For the rest of us, we have no idea what we're talking about at all, at all. 
But it's not only individuals who do things differently. How many know that different generations do things differently? Older generations like me, it is not about they have to do things the same way we did things. It's about they have to do things the way God's calling to them to do it. And we get to come alongside, hopefully, with some wisdom and experience and teach you a few things that you may not already know. So wholehearted people, here's what we know. At some point, a dream has to kiss a discipline for it to be a reality. Wholehearted people do the same things as others. They just do those things differently. For Joshua, he would not depart from Moses' tent. He wasn't comfortable staying at his own tent. And also, wholehearted doesn't mean always feeling. You don't always feel things. But it doesn't mean that you don't do them just because you don't feel them. It means we're fully devoted. We're fully persuaded. We're all in. For Joshua, that meant getting up in the morning. I don't know what it looks like for you, but I promise you, between your dream and your desire is a discipline that you need. And it's not based on your behavior. You don't have to be perfect at it, but you do have to be honest that you have to grow. Oh, oh, oh.